wants to chat about functional programming, it'd be great. And this, we're going to go on a quick tour of the Scala F FP ecosystem. Um, Right, so I work for a company called iOffice. We've been using Scala um, in production for about six years. Uh, we have a large Java monolith that we've converted to about 80% Scala. Then we have about 30 uh, microservices that are all in Scala except for one that's in Node. Um, we mostly have been using Scala as a better Java. Um, and then in our microservices, we uh, are using Play Framework. But over the last year, year and a half, we've been trying to go down the more pure functional path um, because of some of the benefits that that can bring you. So I'm curious, here, who here uses Scala at work? Okay. And who uses it as uh, in the better Java style? Okay. Uh, maybe one who uses it kind of light bend Scala, so play framework Akka. Okay, one, a few, and then Spark. Who are there data people? Okay, and then so who gets to who does kind of the pure FP style either in work or in their spare time? Okay, a few of you. So you guys will probably be quite familiar with what I'm talking about, and then the rest of you are the perfect target audience for this talk. So um, I like to have a little bit of a conversational style. So if you feel free to interrupt me at any time and if you have questions on anything or if I gloss over something a little bit too quick, just let me know. Um, so just a few thanks in advance. A lot of this talk that we're going to go through was kind of inspired by this book here, Functional Programming for Mortals. A lot of, um, I'd watched Monad tutorials for a long time and couldn't really figure out how I could apply these things to creating an application, um, but uh, going through this book really made a lot of things click for me, and that's kind of the uh, process I've gone through in this talk, is following somewhat of the same path. We can't go t into as much detail as a book, obviously. Um, and then this uh, talk on YouTube by Tipolcat or Rob Norris, uh, Functional Programming with Effects, very good talk to get you uh, up and running, and when you want that kind of Monad tutorial and you think you're ready for it, this is a good one to go to. And then just thanks to the community as well for helping me with all my questions. So hands up who thinks they have a good feeling for what referential transparency means. Okay. All right. Great. Perfect. So can anyone, who are these programs the same? Val A equals an expression, AA, and then program two is a tuple of the expression. Does anyone know if these two programs are reference are the same? Okay. So yeah, the answer it's going to be the answer is it depends on what the expression is. Um, so what about this one? If the, we change the expression to be uh, literal forty two, what do we think? This are these programs the same? Okay. Correct. Print line high, tuple of AA, and then print line, print line. Are these programs the same? No? Okay, so these, uh, so that would maybe hint that print line is not referentially transparent. Um, this one, iterator.next, iterator.next, iterator.next. The same? Okay, great. Everyone getting a feel for referential transparency? What it means, you can replace the um, you can replace the reference to the value with the value itself without changing the meaning of the program. What about this one? Array one two three. Do we think this is these two programs are the same? Um, so these ones are, but um, the answer I'm going to say is that it depends. And it depends on what the uh, values inside the array are. So it, um, in this case, because 1, 2, 3 um, are non-side affecting, then this is, these two programs are the same. But if, this, if, 
uh, was iterator.next, 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 then they wouldn't be. Um, so an expression is either referentially transparent or it's not. If it's not, we call it a side effect. Um, this referential transparency property is a semantic property of programs, which um, means that it is a property referring to the meaning of things. So it's not a syntactic property. We're not really using any different syntax here. It's the same syntax in both programs, um, but the meaning of the program is the same, or it's not if it doesn't have the property of referential transparency. Um, so functional programs are a collection of expressions. We uh, run in a functional program means evaluating all of those expressions. And as long as they are referentially transparent, um, we can get a lot of benefits and eliminate entire classes of bugs. It helps us reason about our programs by substitution um, because we are able to uh, substitute in the right-hand side of this value into the place of A and A without changing the mean of the program. And that can be uh, quite powerful when you're refactoring um, or debugging. Um, and we build bigger programs out of smaller ones by composing them. Now, I said that if something is not referentially transparent, then it's, we call it a side effect or an effect. Um, so we're going to go through some, effect, some different effect types that you might be familiar with. Um, so option is a data type that represents the effect of the, an absence of a value. So we can see the seal trade option here, and we have one case which is none, so no value. You substitute a, a nothing into the type parameter here. And then you have a case class of sum A, which gives, tells you that you can get an A out of this value. So the effect here is the effect of absence or nullability, potentially. Um, another effect is either. So in this case, we have two type parameters. So you can have an A or a B. And you can say, see that the left, this case class left here, this returns the A, whatever, this is, whatever type this is. And case class right returns the B, whatever type this is. Um, so that's the effect of having some type or a different type. Reader is another type that you might find in libraries like CATS or Scala Z. And what it does is it has an E and a, uh, two type parameters again, an E and an A. And it can be used for abstracting over the effect of needing to provide something uh, to a function uh, or to a chain of functions, basically. So it can be used uh, quite nicely for um, passing configuration down the chain of a program. Um, so when you call run, you're going to get back another reader with the same configuration that you passed in and with the computed result. Um, so what do these effects have in common? Well, they all compute an answer, but they also encapsulate something extra about the computation. And this extra thing that they encapsulate is what we call the, an effect, but it's a little bit vague. So in programming specifics, can we be more specific about what they have in common? And what they have in common is they all have this shape, F of type A, even if they don't immediately look like they have the same shape. So option is uh, the easiest one to tell. Uh, type f of a equals an option that takes one a. Either you can make it have the same shape, f of a, as long as you give it an e first. So if you kind of partially apply the type signature, um, then it will result in a new type signature that takes one type a. Same for reader. And this f of a shape is quite important. Uh, in functional programming because f is the effect. And if we want actually our programs to actually do things, then we have to be have ways of doing uh, effectful programming. So this is a program in f. So whatever some context may be an option or an either or a reader that computes some value of type A. Does anyone have any questions on that so far? Not at all? OK, great. Oh, I forgot to start my timer. 
So normally, in a, if you you might see a similar introduction to a talk um, on YouTube, and now they would go into the Monad tutorial. We're going to skip the Monad tutorial. There's lots of them out there, and we're going to go straight to designing an application. Um, and we are going to talk about how we're going to use this shape in the designing of an application. So the application we're going to talk about is um, a service that just uses Twilio to send a text message. Um, originally, when I had this talk designed, I thought that the Twilio service we have deployed at iOffice was small enough to talk about in full. Definitely can't talk about that in an hour. I tried. Um, so I've pared it down to as small a service as possible. But most of the code that you're going to see is code that's copied and pasted from a service that's in production at the moment. So our app needs to receive a HTTP request from the internet and then use using Twilio's API, send a text message. It also, Twilio has a, a concept of phone numbers where you have to buy a phone number from, uh, hands up, who has used Twilio? Okay, that's fine. Uh, Explain then. So Twilio has a concept where you buy phone numbers from them and then you use those phone numbers to do things. So one part of our app is we don't want to buy a new phone number every time um, a new text message request comes in. So we want to buy a phone number, store the fact that we own a phone number in the database and use it for all the, all the texts for the next month. So that means that our service or application needs to talk to three places outside of itself. One is the internet needs to receive the HTTP request, one is the database, and one is Twilio. Now, what are the actions it's going to perform on each of these external services? Uh, receives a request to send a text message. It asks the database to get a number. It is able to save a number to the database and then it really actually sends the text for real by talking to Twilio. Now these actions, uh, it turns out, oh, and actually, sorry, and we need to be able to buy a number from Twilio. So as it turns out, these actions are the main side effects that your service is going to have to perform. So by laying things out like this, even though it's quite simple, all, each of these arrows is a side effect, and we can turn it into a method on an interface, and I'm going to show you how to do that. Real quickly, before I do, I show you the code, I'm just going to introduce Scala Z. Uh, hands up who's familiar with Scala Z? Who's familiar with cats? Okay, so um, two libraries that largely overlap in functionality. They, uh, Scala Z will provide some data structures like non-empty lists that behave in a nice functional way. They don't have um, dangerous methods on the control exceptions and also it's going to give you a set of foundational type classes like functor but the important one that we're going to use is going to be monad and we will use that um, when we get to the business logic of our application. Um, if I talk about Scala Z you can probably assume that cats can do it as well. Um, okay so in the book FP for mortals the, what they talk about is after you've identified what your side effects to the outside world are going to be, is you want to create your algebras. And it turns out that algebras, at least as described in the book, are kind of just like interfaces. Um, so for each of the external services, the um, database and Twilio, I'm going to define a trait that's going to uh, define methods on it that perform those side effecting actions. So the two that we need um, so this is going to be the, uh, the trait that talks to our database. Um, so the database is just going to have a phone numbers table on it. And from the database, I need to be able to get any available phone number, and I need to be able to save a new phone number. What's important about this trait is this shape that we talked about earlier. So I'm saying that within this trait, there's going to be some type F that we don't really know about yet. We don't need to know about it. All we need to know about it is that it can take another type. So it has one type hole that we can fill in. And what we do is that the return of all of the methods in this trait are just going to be an F of the thing that we actually need. Is there any questions? 
so far about what I'm doing here? Any questions on syntax that I'm using? We're all familiar? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I'll talk about the imports in a moment. The second interface is going to be for talking to Twilio. Um, the main method here is going to be send SMS. This takes a Twilio number, whatever that is, um, and a Twilio SMS, and it returns an F of a unit. And that's because we're going to assume that if this method returns uh, without an error, the message was sent. So we don't actually need to know um, any information in response. Uh, we'll be able to encode the success and the error paths used in the type that we choose for F later on. Um, of all, we also have get new number down here, which returns an F of a Twilio number. And then I added these two kind of helper functions because they are related to Twilio. Um, but you'll see later that they don't necessarily side effect and it's just convenient to have be able to do them in the context of F so that they can compose nicely with the other stuff that we're doing. So once I have my interfaces, I can go straight to my business logic. So if in FP parlance, if these are called algebras, maybe a little bit easier way um, to think of them as interfaces, then our business logic in FP parlance are called modules. So a module is something that is itself pure, or what that means is that every method in it is referentially transparent. And a module can only depend on other modules or algebras, or in our case, interfaces. So the dependencies to this phone numbers class, we see that we also say that we're going to need an F eventually here, um, is our two interfaces or algebras that we've defined. So our phone numbers repo and our uh, Twilio interface. So the phone numbers module or our phone numbers business logic needs some methods from this trait and some methods from this trait. And this is where we kind of use the first data type from Scala Z. So we have an F here because we need to pass in an F to, in to both of these two interfaces. Um, but we want to be able to use these methods in our nice Scala for comprehensions, which we've all probably come to know and love. But to do that, right now, F is totally abstract. It has absolutely no functionality. But by doing this implicit F and saying that F has to have a monad instance, we're going to get some niceties with like map and flat map that allow us to use anything that is in an F in a for comprehension. So anyone have any questions about that or how that works? Okay, great. Um, all right, so now this get Twilio number, this is what it means to our business to get a Twilio number. And for us, what it means is we need to check the database to see if there is a number available. Maybe we'll get a response or maybe we won't. If we do get one, we just want to return the one from the database. But if we don't get one, then we're going to use the Twilio interface to get a new number, save it, and then return the saved number. Straightforward enough? No questions? Okay. Then our second module is going to be what interacting with a text message means for your business or for your service. Um, again, this text module uh, depends on the same two interfaces, and we're also saying that F is a monad here. And the, t the two methods that we want in this module are send text. So what that's going to do is, is, or sorry, this second dependency is our phone numbers module, not the phone numbers interface. Um, so the one we were just looking at on the previous screen. So we want to use this module to get a Twilio number. We don't care whether it gets it from the database or whether it gets it from Twilio. Um, we're going to take in our text message. This is the text message that will be defined, um, kind of our data transfer object that gets accepted by our API. But to for it to be valid for Twilio, we need to do a couple of things, which is validate the phone number, the two phone number, to make sure it's a real phone number. 
uh, Twilio has a nice little service that lets us do that. And then convert our idea of what a text message is to a Twilio text with a valid number. And then we're going to use the text interface to actually perform the effect of sending the number. Any questions there? All right, great. Now, so, so far we have our interfaces and our business logic. And the reason we've gone to all this effort is it's our business logic that we won't really want to test and test heavily. We're using um, third-party libraries to talk to databases or to talk to Twilio APIs. W we will want to test them eventually, um, but we can assume that they do what they're supposed to do. Um, so we want to keep them out of our business logic as much as possible to make testing this easy. One of the benefits of having this ab abstract F is going to hopefully become apparent when we go test this business logic. Um, so to get our testing set up, we're going to use another new data type uh, from Scala Z or from CATS called state. And what state is, is in a similar way to reader, where it takes in some information, then computes a value, and gives you back the information that you passed in and the value. State will take in um, what I'm going to call world. It's going to compute some value. And that computation of that value might change world. And then it's going to give you back the new world and the computed value. Does that make sense to everybody? It can be a little bit wonky to get your head around. Um, so this world object is going to represent everything that's outside of our service in our tests. So instead of having to talk to a database or talk to Twilio, we're just going to have this case class called world. And the only state in our service at the moment is our database table. So this list of Twilio numbers just represents our database table um, out in the world. So one of the things that we're testing is going to has a dependency on a phone numbers repository. So we need to provide a, a mock implementation or a dummy implementation of this phone numbers repository so that we can instantiate the module that we're trying to test. And that's where state helps us out because state, once you give it a world, now has the shape that we want, which is an F of an A. Um, and that allows us to implement these functions in the context of state um, and provide implementations. Um, these imports here, they're coming from Scala Z as well. So they're just, there's just some, a couple of nice helper methods um, that work with state. Um, and the only method that we need to implement is get available. Um, so get, this returns a function that will take um, a world and return an A. So this get, then we're mapping over our state. So we're passing in the world. We're going to see if there is a phone number in our list. Um, and we're going to just check Twilio number has a property on it called in use in case someone is already using it. And if they're not, um, it will uh, return true. So if nobody's using the phone number, it's available to send a text message and return true. Um, and then the other method that we have to implement is save. Um, and save is just going to use a little private helper down here. Um, it's going to get the world out of our state object, and then it's going to copy the world, put in our new phone number, and then put the new world object back into the state object and return it. Any questions on that? Okay, good. Um, you, we would have to implement a stateful Twilio interface as well. But just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over that. But it's done in the same way with the state object and with the world. Um, but we don't actually care about what Twilio is storing on its side. So we don't have to worry about mimicking Twilio's database in our world object. So we can just kind of ignore it. Okay, so when you've gone to that effort, 
here is kind of why it can be why you would want to. So our phone numbers, module or logic, should buy a new number if necessary. Um, so we need to create our initial world, and our initial world has an empty database, so just an empty list. Um, we need to have the phone number we're expecting um, our logic to buy. So our expected number is this Twilio number, just has a created date, it's not in use, um, and then just these dummy values. And then our expected world, so after we run our program, we expect the world to, instead of having an empty list, to have a list with one phone number in it. So now we have our phone numbers module. We're going to call get Twilio number on it, which is going to return a state object, which need, you still need to give it a world. But when you give it a world, it will return uh, the new world plus the computed value. So, and this run method is on the state object. So I'm calling run on the state object, passing in the initial world. I get back a tuple with the new world and the phone number that was created. And then I can just simply check that the new world should be the expected world and the phone number should be the expected phone number. And this being able to compare, ha being able to do initial world, expected world, and then comparing new world to the expected world, and my experience makes the tests much more easier to read and um, you can have much much less exertions overall and you can get quite detailed in how you define your world object and um, so you can test all the various uh, scenarios that you need to any questions on testing before we move on yeah go ahead Um, yep, so with Scala mock, you can um, mock out your implementations in the same way, but by, abs so by abstracting over the F, that's what lets you use state, the state data type, to control your world and do... Um, um, and then basically kind of get these nice comparisons. So and I, maybe there is a way with Scala mock as well to have it um, do something very similar, even with the world. Um, but you have to remember that we're kind of building up on the foundation that, and I should have said this earlier, we're going to make the assumption that we believe referential transparency is a good thing. So. If we choose to program in that way, we need to build up and duplicate some of the behaviors like Scala mock um, that we would have if we were programming in an imperative way instead of a pure FP way. And so this is an example of two things really. One, how we can mimic that dependency mocking. And two, the, little, the niceties we get from abstracting over F and getting to use the state object. Thanks for your question. Um, okay, so I want to move on to a new library real quick. What's my time looking? Okay, um, so ZIO. This is what we're going to use to fill in our F. All right, has, hands up who has seen a talk either yesterday or today on ZIO so far or on, the, on YouTube before this event? Okay, who's familiar with Cat's Effect? Okay. All right, so for those of you who haven't, I'm go, going to go through this real quickly. Um, if you saw a ZIO talk, you probably saw a description of using it for dependency injection with environment and using it as a, a bimonad with an error type. We are going to just skip all of that for um, sake of time and assume that we're just going to use it as in maybe a traditional old effect uh, monad, which means we're just going to use it in its what ZIO calls a task, which just takes one type parameter A. But ZIO is zero dependence Scala library for asynchronous and concurrent process uh, programming, and it gives you a, t a concrete type in the shape of F of A that allows you to run side effect in code like talking to the internet 
um, talking to a database, uh, or wrapping up arbitrary non-pure code in a pure way so that you can use it um, throughout the rest of your program safely. <laughs> Real quick on how it does that. Um, so this app here is imported from ZIO. And when you extend app, you're going to want to override the run method. And like we spoke about earlier, functional programs are referentially transparent expressions. So when you compose them together, then they haven't done anything yet until they are run at the end of the world. Um, and how you run um, a program in the context of a ZIO at the end of the world is either by implementing this run method, which will return an IO of nothing and exit status. And down here is our program in IO. So when this uh, method gets called, it actually doesn't do anything until you call attempt uh, and then return it from the run method. There is another way. So that extending app is just a little helper feature kind of built into ZIO. If you want to do it more manually and see it more explicitly, how it, so RTS, um, if put string line is our program that returns an IO, then our runtime system here has a method called unsafe run, which will take an IO and run it and do all of the things that it uh, inside the program. So print put string line won't do anything until you pass it into unsafe run. You get the unsafe run method by instantiating a runtime system, and you can get the default runtime system from the ZIO library itself. So anyone have any questions there? And I know this is a very high level overview of what an effect um, library can do for you. The idea is I'm going to show you how it fits into your application and then you can go and learn about all the other features later on once you see how you might use it in a, a real world application. All right, so we're going to use this to provide the kind of the concrete or the real world application uh, implementations of our interfaces. And um, so this is the Twilio one. I'm going to speed up a little bit, um, but please stop me if I'm going too fast. Um, we need to implement our send SMS. The Twilio API is quite nice, but it's a, uh, very much a Java first uh, builder pattern API. And just f for ease of use, we're going to assume that any of this could throw an exception. Um, and if we wrap it in a try, so our, we're going to use the normal Scala try to catch any exceptions in here, then ZIO, which gives us this task object, gives us a nice method called from try. So this will turn a normal Scala try into um, a succeeding or a failing ZIO object. Um, ZIO uses task as a way to describe a ZIO that takes one type parameter. Um, it will use other uh, type aliases for describing other types of ZIO, which might take two type parameters, one being the error, one being the value. Um, or three type parameters, one being the environment that's needed for the ZIO to run, then the second one being the error, and the third one being the value that's completed. Task skips the error and the environment and just uh, has one type parameter, which is the value. Yep. Correct. So when you call this method in here is going to be lazy. So it's not going, that's a good point. So if this was a future out here, when you call send SMS, the body of the method will execute and when you call send SMS. But the way that ZIO works is that everything will be made lazy so that it doesn't actually get run until you pass it into that unsafe run sync. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, and then we have the, the other two methods that we need to implement. Um, one of them does talk to the Scala API or to the Twilio API, that's validate number. Um, and we have another 
uh, helper object that helps us do the Twilio lookup that I haven't shown you, but this returns a task as well, which uh, lets me use it in the for in a for comprehension, and then um, once I know that this number is valid, I can turn it into a validated phone number object and return that. Up here, though, to Twilio text message, this is just kind of a helper function, and this. Um, implementation is actually pure and referentially transparent, but we're going to use this in places where everything around it is a task. So sometimes it can be nice to just have it already wrapped in a task. And to do that, you get um, io.point, and uh, this could be task.point as well. So point just lifts whatever val pure value you want into the context of an io in the same way that future.successful lifts whatever value you want into the context of a future. OK, so the next interface that we have to implement is it needs to talk to a database. And the most common um, library in the Pure FP ecosystem for doing that is Duby. Um, and what's important to remember is that our goal is to do our database things and get our result back, but get our result back in the context of our task or the context of our IO monad. And Doobie gives us a nice way to do that. So Doobie gives us a um, DSL for writing normal SQL. And this returns what uh, Doobie calls a connection I.O. And if you combine a connection I.O. with a transactor, um, you can turn it into your own I.O. type. Um, so in this case, we've cr uh, the docs have created a transactor of type IO, and this IO doesn't come from ZIO, it comes from cat's effect. Um, but because this is abstract, we can fill this in with our own effect type as long as it meets some certain criteria, which we'll talk about. Um, so this is what's going to, and then when you run it again, you, n you see this unsafe run sync. So after you call transact, still nothing has happened, nothing has talked to the database until you call unsafe run sync. And in our case, unsafe run sync needs a runtime system. And an, uh, so cat's effect needs a runtime system as well, but they pass it in slightly differently. So here's our implementation. We're going to start off with just the help, a helper object that contains all of our SQL that we're going to need. So we need to insert a Twilio phone number. Uh, we need to find by a Twilio phone number, and we need to get any single number that's not in use, and that basically means where the in use column is set to false. So this helper object is going to help us implement our trait, which looks like this. So now we're saying that we're going to extend our phone numbers repository, but now we know what type of F we want, so we're hard coding in task here. We're importing the other object that I just said, which gives us access to get any single uh, not in use. and at this point, it's a connection I.O., and it's not going to turn into a task until I call it transact and pass in a transactor. And I'm going to show you later on how we're going to create that transactor. And then save something similar, except now we're in a four comprehension. Connection I.O.s happen to be monads as well, which means that we can compose them before we run them. So we're going to insert a new phone number, and then we're going to retrieve the phone number that we just inserted and we're going to return it. Um, and all of this is in the context of connection IO until we call transact, which turns it into a task. Any questions on Doobie or what I've done with it there? OK, great. All right. The last part of what we need to interact with the outside world is we need to be able to receive a HTTP request. HTTP 4S, anybody heard of this or used it? OK, a few of you, great. Um, um, HTTP4S, again, gives you a way to create your HTTP server or client, but it has abstracted over the effect type, so you can substitute in um, cat's effect or, with a little conversion, ZIO effect. So it lets you create your server in the context of any F, and then at the last minute when you want to run your server, you say, OK, well, now the F has to be cat's effect or uh, a ZIO task. And this is kind of its DSL, so it's quite uh, similar to a, maybe a lot of other HTTP DSLs you've seen. 
uh, uses pattern matching for to define a route. Um, this is the path, this is the method, and then it just you return a response. Once you have your routes, um, you once you define your routes, you have what's called um, a service in HTTP 4S language, and you are going to bind your service to the server, and that's what we're going to talk about here. So this is our HTTP service, um, and a little helper method to return the service, and this is where we start saying that our F is an effect so that it is compatible to with HTTP 4S, so whereas in my modules I said F is a, is a monad, which is less powerful than an effect, I'm now saying that it has to be an any F as long as it's an effect, and that's what makes your F compatible with HTTP 4S. Um, I have two endpoints, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, one which uh, is for sending a text, so we're going to decode some JSON. Uh, HTTP 4S has a real nice interface with Circe, uh, which gives you a decoder or encoder for any case class. So once you create a case class, there's no boilerplate for creating the uh, codec. And then once I have a text message request, I can just ha use my text module to send the text, and hopefully we're going to get to error handling in a sec. Any questions on HTTP 4S? Okay. Um, all right, so now that I have the service, how I turn it into... HTTP 4S will turn that into a stream, and we're not going to get a chance to talk about FS2. But when I bind my service, which is my endpoints, to uh, this builder or server, it's going to return a stream. So we still haven't done anything yet. We're not we haven't turned on any server yet. But once this stream is consumed in our main method, um, that's what's going to turn on the server. All right, so we're going to skip login. Um, to get to error handling, and then wiring everything up. So in our business logic, you might have noticed that we didn't really do any error handling. And the reason for that is a monad isn't powerful enough to do anything in the case of an error except just stop your program executing. But there is a type class which gives you error handling ability that will work with a monad, and that type class is called uh, monad error. And if you make your F be a monad error as well as a monad, then you get the ability to, you, it gives you a recovering method, which allows you to deal with the um, errors in a way that you want to, uh, and carry on the computation. So the recovering method needs to have this, what you pass into it needs to be a partial function of throwable to unit. And um, so in this case, I'm going to implement a Raygun error handler, which will implement this recovering method and send my exception to Raygun, and then just return a unit so that um, my program can carry on with life. Um, you want to do this in for, you want to call recovering when you have expected exceptions or expected errors so that you know what you want to do with it. Any unexpected exceptions you should not recover from and you should let bubble up to the top so that they terminate execution and um, they will get sent to Raygun as well so that you can take action on them. But this is recovering and recovering with and that sort of thing. These are for expected exceptions, the kind of business logic exceptions that you know what you how you want to handle. Um, okay, so let me skip to wiring up the app so you all see how it all works. So to put all of these things together and actually get your app to run, you're going to need a main method. And in this case, instead of extending the app helper object from ZIO, we're going to extend stream app, but for the simple reason that our HTTP server returns a stream instead of um, a, a ZIO, but our, H our stream knows how to consume ZIOs, so we can pass the ZIOs into our stream and um, expect it to work as it normally would. And by extending this stream app, we get this override, we get this stream method that we have to implement, which is similar to the method 
that I showed you in the ZIO documentation, the run method that consumes a ZIO, except this one just consumes a stream. Um, so now we have to provide all the dependencies for app. You can do this with dependency injection frameworks, so you don't have to do this manually for a large app. But for a small to medium-sized apps, it's, I, I find it not super burdensome. Um, if you have questions about login and configuration, talk to me afterwards, because um, we didn't get a chance to talk about those. But here is where I'm constructing the concrete implementations of all my dependencies. So all of my interfaces, I I'm going to get talk to my Twilio implementation. Um, it takes some configuration, which is the Twilio API key and um, password. And it, that's going to return an instance of my Twilio implementation. Here, I'm getting an instance of my Doobie implementation for my phone numbers. And once I have these two things, I can construct my business logic objects, which it, by passing in uh, their dependencies. And finally, now it's at this point where I say phone numbers is going to operate in the context of task. And it's at this point where I say text is going to operate in the context of task. So before this, phone numbers and uh, text have had no idea of whether we were going to use future or cat's effect or ZIO. Um, and once uh, the text is the only dependency that my HTTP server has, so I can now call uh, text HTTP server dot HTTP stream and pass in my text business logic, and when I this will return a stream, and this stream will get consumed um, by stream app and spin up your server. And I'm sorry that I'm running out of time, but I find that this is quite a nice way to organize your application. Um, you get the testing benefits. You get clear separation of concerns between your interfaces um, and your business logic. And you also get all the power of being able to decorate your F with all the various type classes like monad and monad error. Um, in the cases of logging, you can decorate it with a, lo a logger type class, which gives you some logging functionality. Um, and when it all combines, you get a really nice, I think, also easy to read, easy to communicate with others, safe, pure application. And thank you for listening. Um, is there any questions? Do we have time? Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question. What if you the two questions? First, what if I want different effects in uh, phone number repo and Twilio uh, interface? And the second one is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is your opinion about uh, the uh, ZL and the cat's effect? Okay. Um. So you can use different effect types, um, and they ZIO provides some really nice helper objects for converting between effect types. Um, so one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about was that HTTP4S, it only knows about cat's effects things. It doesn't know anything about ZIO. And yet, you can use it with ZIO because of the nice helper methods that ZIO provides to turn at the last minute implicitly a ZIO into a cat's effect. Um, in your application, in your main method, when you get down to whether whether you're, uh, you have a main method or a run method from ZIO or a stream method from FS streams, you need to commit to one single effect type at this point. But before this point, you can use many different effect types as long as you have a way to turn them into the one you want to use in your when you get to the end of the world, basically. Does that make sense? So in the, for example, in the constructor of phone numbers, I need to pass the, the, the function that can convert the, my, the, the type from repo to the type to. No, good, good question again. So when you import the helper objects from ZIO, um, you get implicit conversions from ZIO to cat's effects and vice versa. So you won't have to pass anything explicitly as long as you have your imports correct. But if you have, come up with an arbitrary effect type that you want to slip in the middle there, uh, you're going to have to come up with those converters yourself. But you can make them so that you're not explicitly passing them, that they're convert doing the conversions implicitly. Um, 
And then on your second question, I don't really have any strong opinions uh, about Cat's Effect versus ZIO. I like where ZIO and the ecosystem is going, um, but I think the competition is healthy, and I just happen to have learned all of this from a book that uses Scala Z. Um, I could have easily learned it from a book that used Cat's and have gone down the Cat's path. Um, so all the ideas are interchangeable, in my opinion. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for the talk. My question is, did you use the type level stack at the first place in your company, or did you move pro progressively from uh, maybe a light band stack or um, before? Yep, so we, went, so we have a, a J2EE monolith, which we converted to Scala. So we've used Scala is a better Java. And then in our microservices, we use Play. And we, we do have one service that kind of has a small little ACA cluster, but we're trying to get rid of that. So we have used the light band stack. Um, and now we're kind of seeing uh, how the type level stack can help us. Um, it's so we've used it in all different if iterations, but definitely we have most experience in the light band uh, style. Um, but we're now trying to pull my team basically in the FP direction. Uh, it can just be hard to find the time to do the training and all of that sort of thing. So there are trade offs. Yeah, that's that's the case we experienced in our company. We were using the Lightman stack, using Play Framework and Lagom, mm -hmm. and uh, now we switch it to the type level stack. We're using HTTP Forest and Doobie and and uh, mm -hmm. Cat's Effect and everything. Mm -hmm. so I I think it it can it's definitely worth the switch. Um, in some ways I was lucky uh, at work because my boss was like. I see the benefits and you can go down this path and we can commit to this, but it's up to you to train the rest of the team and bring them along. I think that to go that way, for your company to take that direction and go for that switch, you have to invest in the training. Um, yes. You can't, I don't think you can expect people to go home at night and study because some of these concepts are hard to pick up initially, um, and they can take a few hours of just banging your head against the wall. People have families and stuff. You might get maybe 10% of programmers who are willing to do that, who are willing to spend their free time learning these things, and that's brilliant when you have them. But your teams are probably filled with people who have uh, responsibilities and can't do that, so that means you have to invest work time into training them. And I think it's worth it, but you have to convince have to the higher-ups yeah. to do that. Thank you very much. No problem. We're probably out of time, are we? Or do we have time for another question? All right, thanks, guys, for coming. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>